you know, when we talk about um, the Constitution, uh, uh, and when we talked, and, you know, when we just heard about the kind of question, well, like there was this issue of the fact that people have to, uh, by law, have a Constitution Day. Um, it seems kind of old-fashioned to some people, probably, right? I mean, we we live in an age in which uh, we oftentimes um, criticize, uh, uh, deconstruct, uh, and those things are valid, right? I'm I'm not opposed to it. I'm, I'm I mean, uh, Brandeis's motto, where I went and got my PhD, is truth even unto unto its innermost parts. So I think it's perfectly fine to assess these things, and and clearly the past is a you know just like our own present. Uh, is filled with things to, to critique, uh, to revere. And, uh, and, and kind of thinking about that balance, I think, is important. But I think for Constitution Day, I think it's worthy of some reverence. Um, because I think that I, I'm, I'm old-fashioned enough to think that we still live in the greatest country in the world. Uh, I'm unabashed about that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I'd, I was happy to volunteer to go to Afghanistan in uniform. Um, uh, and I think that part of the reason why uh, this country is so great, uh, I mean, a big part of it is our society, right? Um, I think I'd, I'd lose my classical liberal card if I thought that the only thing that made us great was our government. Um, but <laughs> uh, for sure, right? Um, but I'm not an anarchist, and I, and I think that we have a constitutional you know, order uh, that owes a lot, and our success owes a lot to the fact that we, have, we do have a really enlightened constitution. Uh, and there's such, and there's so much to learn from that constitution. Again, there are things to to kind of pick at for sure, um, but I think that a due reverence for some of these things is in order. And I'm going to talk to you about one of the, my favorite parts of the constitution. And here's why I'll be critical: that was wonderful at the beginning and has been abused almost ever since, uh, which is the war powers. Um, but I do think it's, it's worth celebrating this, this document, not merely talking about it in a scholarly fashion. Uh, and I wanted to say that up front. Um, now, I think one of the things that's, that we have to be careful about is that one of the reasons, one of the things that will increase our odds of remaining great would be faithfulness to that Constitution, um, particularly the parts that have proven their wisdom, either because we followed it and it has led to our successes, or where we haven't, and history is a, is, is a teacher, right? It's the lamp of experience that shows us maybe we should return to some parts of it. And that includes the parts dealing with executive legislative relations and war and peace issues, some of the most important features of the Constitution, but not the ones you probably hear about most in class, honestly, right? Like, and for good reasons, right? Who doesn't love? I do. Um, you know, a good discussion of Federalist 51 or 10, right? Those are seminal parts of, um, or discussions of our constitutional order. Uh, and they're worth delving into, but war and peace issues aren't the things that I remember in class focusing on, but they're some of the most important. Um, and I think if there's one takeaway I have for you tonight, it's that we have strayed from the Constitution on war making, but fortunately there's a path back to it that I'm hopeful that this country will take. Uh, and it's in the works, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that during my talk. Then I'm going to pivot to talk more about Afghanistan, especially because this has been such a big part of my life, not just over the last you know, few years, uh, where I have been a, a vociferous advocate of withdrawal. Um, probably to a lot of my colleagues, uh, probably too much like a, a kind of rabid dog on this. Um, but uh, it's something that I've been very passionate about, uh, but also longer because, you know, this has dominated uh, people who are uh, Gen Xers like myself. This has been a dominant part of our politics is the war on terror. Um, and, uh, you know, it almost seems like yesterday uh, Professor Bove and I were actually uh, on the green at Wesleyan University on September 12th. And there was a gathering of the community there. And, we were, and the president of the university was talking about this. And this is where Andrew and I kind of looked at each other and kind of read each other's eyes. And, and we, were thinking, we were thinking some similar things. And, and, uh, and it's re really where uh, part of the reason I'm here today, I think. Uh, uh, but it was, it was such a traumatic experience, especially you know, for people living up there. You know, we were talking earlier at dinner about how we had students in our classes that were trying to figure out what was happening with their families in Manhattan. 
uh, or lived in Jersey or Connecticut, Long Island. Um, and it's easy to forget, forget that because for a lot of people, right, I'm guessing for some of you, you, you probably were, uh, any freshmen here? So you probably weren't even alive, right? Um, probably born in what, 2003? Um, and so in some ways it's already starting to, to recede, um, but maybe not enough in some ways because we've been fighting this war related to that for so long. Um, and so it, it, is, it, it can stay in front of mind. Um, but again, my basic point is that we're out of sync with the original Constitution and that the original Constitution is better at doing what the Constitution was meant to do, which was in many ways, I think, uh, to preserve our experiment in liberty and democracy that was kicked off by the Declaration and the Revolution. Now again, those are fraught waters for political theorists, I know. You know is the Constitution a continuation of the, of the revolutionary spirit or is it a conserving force that stole some of the thumos out of that revolution? I'll let your professors talk about these things and others. But um, now, I want to talk about the reasons the Founding Fathers designed it the way they did. And I think this historical background can frame how we think about some of the reforms that are working their way through Congress right now. So what does the Constitution say about war powers and executive legislative relations? Well, the president um, that's created by the Constitution is actually a lot weaker than the one you guys have grown up with. Uh, you know, you walk on the, on the White House grounds in Washington, they're beautiful. And what you see is, is, it's actually the front, but it looks like the back, is you see all these cameras arrayed there. And you see the news stations doing their, you know, they have the White House behind them and they're doing their bid every day. And, you know, it's almost like we have a monarch, right? And this is not the way, you know, this is not the way the Constitution, um, I think, created a president, particularly when it comes to war making, because actually you had to move down the street in the original constitutional design, you have to move down the street uh, to the Capitol. Now again, of course, there wasn't the Capitol at that point. Okay, just to be clear, I know that you know, Philadelphia and New York and other places were part of this original design. But once we had the Capitol, right, um, and the White House, like it was meant, right, powers were meant to be more down there uh, at the end of the street. And so Congress was meant to be more powerful than it has acted. Uh, as one scholar has noted, there is, quote, little in the U.S. constitutional framework that encourages executive dominance of the foreign policy making system. And that's a fairly c consensus view, I think, of the issue. Um, you know, one of the great scholars of this, Louis, Louis Fisher, uh, who worked for the Congressional Research Service, or Library of Congress, for a long time, uh, you know, has a great book on, on this. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, he, his work has so influenced me that, that he should, you know, he should have got half the dinner tonight. Um, you know, and, and you know, what happened is, is that the framers did not want one person to be able to make one of the most important things the state can do, make the decision for that, which is to go to war uh, without any check or connection to the will of the people. Um, and again, will of the people as expressed through their representatives in Congress. You know, there was no sense that we should have a plebiscite. Should we go to war with France? Should we go to war with the UK? Um, you know, it was that through their representatives, right? Um, you know, that Congress was supposed to play a role. And, you know, some of the most dramatic scenes in American history is, are when, you know, Congress has played that role. You think about after the Pearl Harbor attacks and the declaration of war, right? So in cases like that, you've seen Congress step up and act and authorize it. But oftentimes, that has not been the case. Now, at the Constitutional Convention, uh, Elbridge uh, uh, Gary, uh, his, uh, he's the guy that, uh, Gerrymandering is named after. You guys have all heard that, I'm sure, especially this year, because we're doing all the maps. And we get all these strange creatures. Um, you guys are probably in a district with like Pittsburgh. Uh, <laughs> so, um, not there's anything wrong with that. Um, it's why elections matter. Um, but um, G Gary said, he said, he, quote, never expected to hear in a republic a motion to empower the executive alone to declare war. So the founders divided the war powers between the executive and the legislature. This view flowed from their study of history and what they thought were the dangers of executive war making and the dangers those things presented to freedom and the good of the people. And, it, and they also feared that a monarch would become a tyrant. Um, and, and again, if, if they ever start to try to topple George Washington's statues, we should all rush to defend them. And he was an imperfect man. But 
George Washington was such an important figure because of the fact that he shrugged from um, any sense that he would want to become a monarch, right? Um, and until Franklin Roosevelt, no president had served more than two terms following the Washingtonian precedent. Um, and he didn't act like a monarch or a tyrant. I mean, he was regal in a way, right? Um, he was a careful, prudential. Um, he wasn't a scholar by any means. Those were people like Madison. Um, but, he, but he carried himself in a way that lended authority to the role. But, but he, was not, um, uh, he was not someone who I think, he was someone who I think had properly internalized the dangers that the constitutional framers understood could be a problem with this design. And again, the, the founders clearly wanted some energy in the executive. Um, you know, they didn't want to have a system, uh, you know, obviously they, they formed a system that was a mixed regime uh, and that had ba checks and balances and a balance of power. But, you know, they did fear this. And that's one of the reasons why when it came to war making, they didn't want to empower the presidency. Now, another thing is that it flowed from a basic pragmatism, right? And this is a kind of republicanism with a small r, not the party. But the, what the argument about republican wisdom, that, uh, that the many could, be, uh, could provide a, a wisdom, particularly in, in cases where they would have to bear the costs, um, and that the wisdom of the many was superior in this case to that of the one. And that's one of the reasons why they made it hard to, de to declare war, um, because it also meant that it was pragmatic in that you'd have to actually talk to the people, right? Unless it was an exigency, and we'll go into the repelling issue, right? Um, but let's say that we, you know, tomorrow morning we wake up and we're like, you know what? We want to do regime change in Iran. It's uh, too dangerous for them to get nuclear weapons, and um, uh, you know, we, we think that we should go to war with Iran. Well, like, we, the, the, the people who would want to do this in the constitutional system that we have would then have to make the case to the people for why this is so. They would have to hear from the people. Uh, there would be a vote in Congress on whether the president was empowered to do so. And, uh, and if we did go to war uh, with a majority vote, right, then there would be the sense that the people were behind it in some way, or at least a majority was. Now, again, there's always the problem of the minority being you know, tyrannized by the majority. But uh, unlike presidential wars, where presidents go to war on their own initiative, um, where there's a less of a connection to the democratic will. And that was a problem for the founders. And it's not good just period, pragmatically. Um, because then when things go south, like they sometimes do in war making, um, the people don't feel a stake in that decision. Um, and so even if you're someone who wants to go to war more often than say I would, you could see the wisdom of trying to bring the people into the conversation through the people's representatives. Now, of course, Congress critters oftentimes don't necessarily want this because it's much easier to be reactive to what's happening than to actually have to put your vote on something, right? You know, so you have to actually say, we should go to war with Libya, OK? And then when things went south like they did under Obama, then you'd have to have your, your name on there. And it matters, right? I mean, think about the Iraq War. I think there's a lot of Democrats who voted for that war thinking that after 9-11, this would be, you know, uh, and especially after our very early victories in Afghanistan, this was a vote that they didn't want to be on the wrong side of. Because I think a lot of Democrats uh, were anxious that they would seem weak because many of them voted against the first Gulf War that went a lot better than most people thought, including even the military, which had ordered way more body bags than we even needed there because they thought that the casualties would be much higher. Um, so there were a lot of people, I think, who felt, even if the, eh, maybe in another situation they may have voted against it, they felt, uh, hey, we don't want the Democratic Party to be painted weak. So now, one of the things that uh, in Article One of the Constitution, when you get your, your pocket Constitution, um, you'll, you can read this. Uh, you should have one already. Um, but uh, you know, Congress has the power to declare war. And that's either formally or informally. Because even Hamilton talks about how uh, formal declarations of war had fallen out of power, even back then, or fallen out of, uh, of use. Um, but more informal, right? It doesn't have to say declaration of war on the piece of paper. It could be something like an AUMF, an authorization for the use of military power. 
like the 2002 or 2001. So the Afghanistan war and the Iraq war uh, were both cases in which um, this followed the constitutional process. Now, the interesting case is what happens if Congress hadn't gone along with President Bush over Iraq, hadn't authorized it in, with the 2002 AUMF, what would have happened? Uh, same thing back in, in 1991 uh, is you know, whether the, if, if Bush, if uh, President Bush the first hadn't been given authorization from Congress, what would he have done? Um, you know, would he have tried to claim it was an Article II power, which you see a lot of talk more of now? Now, another thing that, that Congress has the power to do is Congress has the power to raise and support armies. To raise and support armies. This is an important distinction, especially for a Navy guy like me. Maintain a Navy. And that language was purposeful. The founders didn't love standing armies. Now, for a lot of us, we think, oh, the idea that you wouldn't have a standing army? Like, come on, can you be a really powerful state with that one, an important state with that one? Well, the framers didn't love standing <laughs> armies. They saw standing armies as a threat uh, to liberty. This is why we have the Third Amendment to the Constitution. Um, and a, a friend of mine is kind of like the president of the Third Amendment uh, Society. Uh, of course, it's a joke, but you could Google it on YouTube. Uh, and, uh, you know, because it's like the amendment that's most ignored in the Constitution. But it shows you, I think, it evinces the spirit of the founders when it came to their view of the military. These guys weren't like, you know, freedom uh, fries and uh, you know, support the troops types guys. These were guys who, they understood the role of power. They weren't immune to that. They themselves, uh, many of them, had, had been served in the military during the revolution. Um, but they were very, they, they viewed it like fire, right? I suppose I shouldn't use that because that when Madison talks about fire, it's faction, not militaries, right? But uh, uh, nonetheless, I think that it holds true, right? Um, they also talked about how the, the, the Congress could call up, organize, and arm the militia. Okay, again, they're kind of suspicion about standing armies. They could regulate the military, and they could budget for war. And one of the things that Congress could do more of if it wanted to try to constrain the executive branch or try to exercise policy making, God forbid that Congress should do policy making, uh, I mean, especially nowadays, and again, I'm not partisan about this stuff. You've seen Republican presidents and Democratic presidents using executive orders to try to legislate, essentially. But Congress has oftentimes given the executive that, uh, that authority. I think it, it mistakenly, um, but you've seen this happen. Um, but Congress could use the, the power of the purse in foreign policy. Um, I don't think this would happen because I think there are majorities in favor of some of the things, but, but let's say that the um, that the, uh, you know, let's say Congress and the President disagreed about the future of U.S. troops in Syria. And despite what President Biden said, we're still at war in a lot of places, including Syria. Um, but if Congress just said, hey, we're going to defund this program, they could pull the funding. Now, it's an incredibly difficult political thing to do because you're essentially pulling, you know, beans and bullets you know, it's like you guys have heard of the Washington Monument strategy during budget talks, right, where they shut down the Washington Monument uh, as a way to make a point about, like, oh, we can't close the government because then, you know, like, you can't go to the Washington Monument. It's symbolic politics, and there's symbolic politics in war making, too. And you could imagine that pulling, pulling beans and bullets from troops when they're out in the field could be very politically problematic. But in theory, they could signal this to the executive, right, and try to, to use this power. Uh, of the purse to affect foreign policy. Um, so Congress has a lot of powers de facto in the Constitution. So what are the presidential war, you know, powers here? Well, they're really limited, right? Constitutional C Convention Delegate Roger, Sher Roger Sherman, uh, he argued that the president, quote, should be able to repel and not to commence war. Um, so the president is empowered to independently repel attacks. So the president could fight purely defensive wars that required fast action, like if the country were invaded. Right? So you know, if, uh, if there was no Hawaii and the Japanese had simply attacked San Diego and, and somehow had, had an amphibious capability to invade uh, California, uh, the president wouldn't have to sit there and wait for Congress to like, assemble and, and declare war he could authorize as the commander in chief the military to repel that attack. That's perfectly consistent with the Constitution. Um, and he could lead the military 
um, when Congress does declare a war, but they could not go to war. The president cannot, by the Constitution, go to war independently without Congress, except to repel. And again, we've gotten away from this design. And again, that could be good or bad. I think it's not a good thing. I, th I think it's unwise. Uh, but I think it, it's hard to make the case, uh, I think, that, and in the Q&A we can talk about this, but I think it's hard to make the case that we're, we're acting consistent with this because Congress has been relatively unwilling to play its constitutional role. Presidents have successfully tried to increase their powers without constitutional authority. Uh, Truman in Korea, right, we fought the Korean War, um, and, and he argued that it was authorized by the fact that the United Nations um, had said this was fine. Um, Ike threatened to use nuclear weapons. Uh, Reagan in Lebanon, uh, uh, George W. Bush in Haiti, and then uh, and the most uh, recent case, really, uh, Obama and Libya. Um, you know, and that's the one that I'm most disappointed in because I knew some of the people that were part of that decision, and they knew better. <laughs> and it's almost fr more frustrating when it's like, hey, you should have known. Um, even the 1973 War Powers Act, I think, has, has been ignored. Um, and, you know, look, it could be argued, and I would argue this, that the War Powers Act, which was passed in response to Vietnam, where there was a sense that the executive branch had been out of control, um, uh, the War Powers Act itself, I, I would argue, is unconstitutional. And that's, that's probably a controversial thing to say, but I think it's unconstitutional because Congress can't give away a constitutional power, in my view, even in a li for a limited time, particularly one of those types of powers, right? It's not like Congress could say, like, hey, um, uh, if we have a, um, you know, if we have a debt crisis, uh, the president could just start legislating for 30 days or 60 days or, um, you know, something like that. Like, that's not something that can be done, right? Um, and in the case of the War Powers Act, we've given the president the ability to use force offensively without a congressional declaration for a certain amount of time. And I think that that's a real problem because, again, back to the reactive-active issue, it's really hard to pull troops out. It's much easier to stop them from going in, especially because once Americans are being killed in combat, it produces things like rally around the flag effects. It induces the sunk cost fallacy, things like that. So it's a real problem. Uh, and I would say the War Powers Act is unconstitutional for that reason. It's also the case that AUMFs, authorizations for the use of military force, have also been too open-ended, and executives have driven trucks through them. Uh, the 2001 AUMF is an example, even though, uh, of course, there needed to be powers given to the president to prosecute the global war on terror after the 9-11 um, attacks. Um, but it was still too broad. So, you know, what could be done? Like, if you care about the constitutional framework that I just talked about, what could be done? Well, Congress could repeal the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs. Um, you could argue that they don't reflect current threats. Saddam Hussein isn't even alive anymore. His regime was deposed. Um, the war in Afghanistan is over. Um, and you know, we, could, we could write authorizations. The Congress could write authorizations to deal with the global war on terror issues, even though we don't call it that, of course. Um, and there are devices. These are devices that invite mischief, right? expanding into new areas, going after new groups. Um, no, if we had to replace these AM, AUMF, some scholars have said, so Steve Pomper and Steve Vladek are two think tankers in Washington that I think have had some good ideas. One, they say that we should, we should replace the 2001 AUMF with one that has very specific groups um, for specific objectives, so you'd have to name the groups. Two is it would preclude explicitly other groups and countries that aren't named, right? So you couldn't just say, hey, this new group that's sprung up in you know, Niger is one that we can go after using this, uh, this one that was used for this other group in Yemen. Um, you could have a sunset provision. Um, you know, so those are some of the things that, that Steve and Steve have argued for. Um, you know, the, again, I talked about the power of the purse. They could do that. Um, Congress did, did do that on Yemen, uh, tried to do that on Yemen. Uh, we're still fighting there, too. Um, they could rep reform the War Powers Resolution. So there are people who are arguing for something called the National Security Powers Act, which would, which would tighten the War Powers Resolution from 73. 
Again, I think it would be ideal to follow the original War Powers Act, which is called the Constitution of the United States. Um, uh, but there, are, there is a lot of energy behind the National Security Powers Act. Uh, this would have time limits. It'd be stricter. Uh, ge ge geographic and mission specificity would be part of that. Um, there'd be automatic funding cutoffs. Um, that makes it easier because then you don't have to take votes. Um, so those are some of the ideas percolating in Washington. Um, now, of these, the ones that are probably most likely to pass would be the 2002 AUMF. Um, so the 2002 AUMF uh, has already passed, uh, uh, a version uh, has already passed in the House. Uh, it passed the Senate Foreign Relations Committee with two Republicans actually crossing over, so somewhat bipartisan. Um, we're, the, there's a floor vote that's waiting. The Senate leadership has indicated they expect to have a vote on this in, in October. Uh, so I think there's a good chance that the 2002 AUMF could be uh, eliminated. That's the Iraq War one. Um, you might even get 65 votes in the Senate, which would be remarkable, actually. I think that's probably optimistic, but you could get you know, 61, 62 votes. And President Biden has indicated he would sign it. Um, now, uh, the appropriations and the NDAA have created a lot of traffic legislatively, um, so we'll see what happens. But again, there's been some talk of an October vote. Um, now, the, the NSPA, um, the prospects for that are reasonable. Not, I mean, it's hard to say. It's been introduced in the Senate. Um, it was actually supposed to be introduced, a, a companion version was supposed to be introduced in the House today. I didn't see if it actually happened. Um, but Lee, Murphy, and Sanders are key forces behind that. So there is a bipartisan thing, right? Um, Mike Lee from Utah, uh, kind of um, Tea Party Republican, and then Bernie Sanders, obviously the opposite of that. <laughs> um, and again, part of this is that there's a bit of a sea change happening in DC and across the country on foreign policy. So there is more talk of this type of thing happening. Now, there was talk before President Obama, as a senator, talked about the importance of Congress playing a role, and then he did Libya. Um, so again, uh, like I'll, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Now, let's kind of shift over to Afghanistan. Um, so like I told you, I'll put my cards on the table. Like I think that we should have got out of this war long before now. Um, and I was a supporter of the, of the original war. Um, I volunteered to go there. And I think that we needed to do three things in Afghanistan, because I think it was a, a necessary war. Uh, I'm a realist, so it was a just war on realist grounds. We could debate about whether it was just on Christian grounds. But it was that definitely just on realist grounds. And we needed to do three things, in my view. We needed to decimate al-Qaeda in Afghanistan as a terrorist organization with the intent and capability to harm us. That's really important when it comes to counterterrorism, because if you have the intent but not the capability, or the capability without the intent, those really aren't dangerous to us. They're things we should keep an eye on, but they're not things that you have to go to war uh, or use over the horizon capabilities against. You think about Nigeria, right? There's a bunch of terrorist organizations in Nigeria, uh, Boko Haram, for example. Right? This is one that has capability, but not intent. Um, so we, you don't necessarily have to deal with, like, this is why kind of that whole notion of the global war on terror, like how do you do a war against a, a tactic? Like it's kind of foolish. I mean, it's a great, you know, it's a great piece of uh, like political rhetoric, I suppose, but it doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it. Because right? you can never win a war on a tactic. Um, and so you have to keep your eyes on the things that are most important. And one of the big things about being a prudential statesman or stateswoman is to do triage, right? To make tr trade-offs. You know, so we don't have we have only limited resources. What are we going to focus on? We should focus on, you know, folks like Al Qaeda before 9/11, uh, folks like Al Qaeda today. So we needed to pun you know, decimate Al Qaeda. The second thing we needed to do is we needed to punish the Taliban government of Afghanistan for its state support for Al Qaeda. And then third, we needed to kill or capture bin Laden. Well, all three of those we accomplished long ago. But what happened in Afghanistan was we expanded our war aims quite dramatically. So we had a war that went from very specific, actionable targeting 
and, ac and, and, and actual things that our military could perform and do it well, uh, to actually fighting a war that the military was ill-suited to fight and that wasn't necessary. So we won the war we needed to fight, but we lost the war that we didn't. So what did we lose? Well, we lost this war of trying to remake Afghanistan, right, to change it in a significant fashion under the notion that we wouldn't be safe unless Afghanistan had significant changes, either economically, socially, culturally, in terms of like, rights, institutions. And, right? We needed to really remake that country. And again, there, there were, when I was there, there were 42 countries in ISAF, which was the name of the mission. Um, and I tell you what, countries had very different views about why we were there. And then you add on to that NGOs and IGOs. I remember talking to someone from UNAMA and like her conception of why we were there, I would have run out of uniform so fast. It would have been like one of those cartoons, right? Like where my clothes were left behind, okay? Um, so there were just a lot of different conceptions. And, and so what we ended up doing is expanding our war aims to include these idealistic goals that were either nice to have or didn't need to have or both, but we couldn't have them. And we saw that in Afghanistan, right? Afghanistan was a place that w w was not something that we could easily, at low cost or reasonably cost, uh, 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 change dramatically. Heck, we couldn't even create a semi-effective central government there. And we saw that. And I think that the collapse of the Afghan government um, actually drove home the point about the failure of our mission there. Now, I don't like take heart at this. Um, I would love to see every place on the planet have respect for the equal rights of all, including women. Okay. Um, I would like to, I'm a classical liberal, right? I, I want, I'd like people to be able to flourish, um, you know, to live their life project as they see fit, um, as long as they weren't engaging in rights violations against others, right? Great, right? Um, but it's not the job of the US government to do that. And even if you thought it was the job of the US government to be a police force or a social worker in other countries, the fact is, is we weren't good at it. We're not good at it. I would argue most countries aren't good at it. The British have tried to shape places for a long, long time, and those places were still very resistant to a lot of change. But at least they, were, they had a, I think a political system and a, and a culture that was probably more conditioned to being able to try such an imperial project. I mean, they didn't even try to send me with my wife and two kids to live in Kabul for 20 years. Okay? If you're gonna, I mean, if you're gonna be a colonial power, you like do it honestly, right? <laughs> um, I mean, they, the, the CENTCOM did s set up something called the AFPAC Hands Program, which is to try to develop some, some specialization. Because one of the problems with the military is that um, you, know, you don't necessarily specialize um, in, in, it's like the State Department too, right? You could get sent to all kinds of different countries. But in the military, right, you know, you could, you could be working in the Navy like I was in Afghanistan, and then I could be in Guam, you know, three years later. Right? But they tried to establish some capability where we'd have some expertise. Because we didn't have a great sense of the culture. We didn't understand it. And it's trite to say that, but look, this was a problem. Especially because, as people have remarked, you know, we fought a series of one-year wars, you could argue. Right? Um, you know, I, I think that if they really wanted to do it the way the coin manual, the way David Petraeus and Mattis and others wanted to do it, um, they didn't meet the criteria for that. And I don't think it was possible. I mean, I don't think Americans would tolerate it, right? We're just not into that kind of thing. Uh, we're, you know, that's just, we're, we're too liberal, and that's a good thing in my view. So we expanded the war aims and we failed to do that, and so I think we needed to, to withdraw. And so, uh, again, on realist grounds, the o Afghanistan is a strategic backwater. It doesn't matter that much. Okay? People are talking about how, well, there's Chinese, the Chinese are interested in minerals there. It's like, that's not how markets work where it's like, hey, regardless of how hard it is to get them, <laughs> they're there and so they must be valuable, right? No, you have to price in the cost of protecting and bringing those things to market and logistics, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, there was a good piece in foreign policy on this uh, the last couple of days, if you're interested. Um, so 
we needed to get out because the only thing that we need to do in Afghanistan to keep us safe and to protect the conditions of our prosperity is to make sure that those terrorist organizations with the intent and capability to harm us can't. And we could do that without having a permanent military presence in the country. We don't need even 2,500 troops. And I'm going to talk about that because you probably watched the news the last couple days with the testimony of General McKenzie and General Milley and, Secretary, uh, and the Secretary of Defense. Um, but the thing is, is that, uh, is that we were in a situation in Afghanistan where we either had to expand the number of troops there to try to perform that, that mission, okay, that mission of changing, remaking, holding up the Afghan central government, or we had to withdraw. It was not tenable to stay with 2,500 troops. Now, we could, again, with withdrawal, we don't have to sacrifice our ability to do CT because we don't need a permanent military presence there or anywhere else in the globe, right? Like, terrorists don't have to be in Afghanistan to harm us. You can be in Yemen. You could be in Niger. You could be in Germany and, and do the planning. Some of the 9-11 attackers were there. Heck, they did some training in Florida. Maybe we should do some coin there. Prove the strip malls, OK? Um, so yeah, Florida man could need some uh, civilizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, but, but I, I, instead, what you saw is you saw a lot of irresponsible voices in the foreign policy establishment saying, like, oh, what we have there is sustainable in terms of the, the drawdown after the Doha agreement in 2020. It was not, right? Because even people like Millie yesterday admitted that whenever we left, it, the things were going to turn out the same. And, and Secretary, oh, sorry, Senator Warren, did you see what she said? Did anybody see what she said? She's like, so basically, people are going to be, you're going to have Americans in harm's way, unnecessary risk, indefinitely. And he's like, yes. And it's still going to turn out the way it did? He even admitted it. And then when you read the Afghan papers, has anybody read the book, The Afghan Papers by Craig, Craig Whitlock? It's a really great book. Uh, if you want the Cliff Notes version, the Washington Post uh, published this, uh, what was it, a couple years ago, I think. Um, you can see there that the admirals and the generals didn't know how to solve the problem of Afghanistan. But they misled the American public that they did. They kept talking about progress. Did you notice a lot of progress made in the solving corruption and inefficiency and ineffectiveness of Jeroa? the Afghan government? Had they solved some of the problems um, in terms of their military structure, which, uh, as Jason Dempsey points out, um, you know, we tried to replicate an American military in a place that, that it was just not appropriate. And that gets back to, like, are we suited to this, right? You know, we should have built a very different kind of Afghan military. They were to come with trade-offs. But trying to build a military that looked more like how we fight as opposed to how it might be more appropriate for there was a conceit, a kind of hubris that we had. We know how to do this. So um, the other thing that kind of makes me, makes me irritated by what I saw yesterday. Oh, back to the yesterday. Um, when McKenzie talked about the, and Millie talked about the 25,000 troops, remember, the reason why Americans haven't been killed since last February until the, the 13 Americans were killed uh, right before we left, the reason why there were no Americans killed in that time period was why? Because we promised to withdraw. Trump signed the, you know, we, the government signed the withdrawal deal, our government signed the withdrawal deal with the Taliban. They're like, yes, go. Okay? And they, I mean, I was actually a little bit surprised. Their operational control, right, their control of their fighters to make sure that they didn't kill Americans and screw up the deal was pretty, pretty um, uh, I think, uh, dis you know, kind of interesting, right, about Taliban capability. Because um, the role of spoilers happens a lot in these types of situations, where more extreme groups don't actually want things to end the way, they were, the way others want them to end. So I think it was pretty, pretty interesting that way. Um, but if you, were, if you broke the deal and kept 2,500 or 3,500 troops, or if you kept Bagram open, the Taliban wasn't going to be like, oh, OK, we can live with that. 
particularly if we were trying to do things to uphold the government of Afghanistan. So imagine we have 25, 3,500 troops in Afghanistan, and the central government is collapsing. A, are we going to sit there and watch it? Especially when people like Millie were talking about we need to be there indefinitely. And then what happens if we do stand by and, and the government falls and the Taliban has a situation where we're all at, at Kabul airport, Kaya, and we're at Bagram, and the, the Taliban are surrounding us? Okay? It's already a problem you know, of mortar attacks and, and uh, IED attacks and things like that. Imagine if the Taliban had the kind of control we see today, but we had these little enclaves there. We'd have been sitting there, and they would take the gloves off, and they would be killing Americans every year. And then our choice would be like, hey, do we need to protect these guys better? That means more troops. Do we need to actually make sure that the government doesn't fall so we have to restart the war? And remember, the war wasn't going well when we had more troops there. Okay, the coalition, US and, and the other countries combined, had about 150,000 troops there during the surge in the early aughts. Okay? Not the early aughts, the uh, early tens okay? under Obama. And we were still having trouble making progress on these goals. Read the Afghan papers. There's still talk, like, how do we do this? We, you know, and, and again, all this talk about progress, progress, turning the corner, turning the corner. Just wasn't happening. Now, people argue that, like, look, our withdrawal was hasty and precipitous. This is malarkey, OK? OK? The Obama, sorry, the Trump administration signed this deal in February of 2020. When were the last troops supposed to come out of Afghanistan, according to the original Doha agreement? May 1st, 2021. That's a long time, isn't it? Okay, and there was a phased withdrawal. We had plenty of time to do this. But I, I think that, that you had a situation in which, especially after, after Trump lost the election, that people thought that Biden isn't going like, to pull us out, because like, responsible people don't end these wars, okay, that's what the foreign policy establishment thinks, right, is that we have to keep fighting these wars. They're indefinite, as Millie talked about. Okay, we have to do this. We have to preserve this uh, kind of American leadership, American credibility. You hear these arguments all the time, right? We can't do counterterrorism without being in these places with large military footprints. Okay. Mind you, we don't have a large military foot footprint in Pakistan, and we still killed bin Laden. Now, again, you could say, well, we use bases in Afghanistan. But look, we could, target, we could hit targets in Afghanistan without being there either. It makes it more difficult. It's more challenging. It's logistically more challenging. But it can be done. So it wasn't hasty or precipitous. This is all attempts by people to, to try to undermine the argument for, the, for, for ending the war. And I think that we really need some accountability. And I think the American public, since they supported the, war, the end of the war, so even after all the scenes at the Kabul airport, which were terrible, and the implementation was messy and, and problematic, and we should demand answers about it, um, but even after that, 78% of Americans supported the withdrawal. So the Americans here have been more realistic than the foreign policy establishment. Now, again, the foreign policy establishment had plenty of people that were for withdrawal, particularly as it became more popular. Uh, but, uh, uh, but still, there was, uh, you know, this took political courage. And I said this, even though I was Trump's nominee uh, to be the ambassador, I still said when Biden made the withdrawal um, decision that I said that this was an act of, of courage, that it took spine, and that the argument behind it was fully in accord with the kind of realism that, that I um, uh, have internalized, that, that I operate under. So I, I was more than happy to say that. Um, you know, and, that and that gets to the fact that I think that this debate about foreign policy that this is a bigger part of, a, a little part of, but it's a bigger fight, is between a transpartisan coalition of people who want to do things the same way we've done them for the last 20 to 30 years, and a rising coalition of realists and restrainers who want to change the way we do things in Washington when it comes to America's role in the world. We want to get out of these forever wars, those of us who are realists and restrainers. We want to get our, shrink our footprint in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, get out of you know, supporting the Saudis in Yemen, okay? really go offshore in the Middle East. The Middle East is of declining strategic importance anyway. Okay? You know, so we're really trying to push on that margin. Um, and so we should eliminate those US footprints there. 
Uh, and that, and, and it's not going to, and, and, and our safety is not going to be, uh, I think, denigrated. In fact, you could argue uh, that we'll be in a better position because we'll be focused less on trying to say support the government of Afghanistan and some of the aims there, or in, you know, trying to protect Kurds in Syria, but instead really focused on the only thing that matters in the Middle East to us in many ways. Okay, when it comes to anything other than oil, right, is um, making sure that terrorist, terrorists can't operate from there with impunity. Again, you don't need to have permanent military presence there. You can use over-the-horizon capabilities, special operations. Now, if you're interested about this kind of broader realism and restraint coalition, I would tell you that it is a very different conception than the one of American leadership, forward presence, uh, you know, uh, concern about it always being 1938, um, the notion that the United States has to be um, uh, the kind of, uh, to extend our, our defense and deterrent capabilities to other countries, uh, that the United States has to fight to change regimes, that those regimes are believed to be inhospitable to the kind of values that we care about, like Syria or Libya, right? It would get out of that way for two reasons. One, it's not the role of government in my view. Okay, the role of government is to protect US citizens and our territorial integrity from those who would harm us, whether at home, that's why we have police, from abroad, that's why we have the military, but also for pragmatic reasons. What we're doing isn't working. If you look at that list, okay, Afghanistan nation building, loss, Iraq, loss, Yemen, I'm not sure we've achieved much there except for creating very bad conditions in that country, cholera outbreaks, supporting you know, a, a pretty awful Saudi government that has engaged in less than careful strikes against Yemeni targets. Um, you have uh, uh, Libya, I mean Syria was a mess, okay, and I have no love for the Assad government, okay, but the, but the Islamists uh, that were fighting against the Assad government, like there's no w white hats in this conflict, okay, a lot of black hats. Okay. So our record is not very good and therefore we need a shift. So why don't I move to, to Q&A? Um, and hopefully people have time. I'm sorry I went a little long, but there's a lot here. All right, questions? Are you going to ask your question about Hellman? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, two questions. Um, one question is uh, the first part of your talk was a plea for a restoration of the Declaration of War Plan to Congress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, question two. Yeah, okay. I'd love to hear your talk about your experience in Afghanistan. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, the first one's easier to talk about than the second one. Uh, um, uh, so, I take the Constitution to be a setup for frustration, <laughs> intentionally, right? Uh, we should be frustrating too much energy in government, period. Um, because we shouldn't trust government that, I mean, we want government to do certain things. We should have the state capacity to do certain things, including making war and peace. Um, but we don't want to make it simple, because when we do things simply, we oftentimes get over our skis. And especially when you don't have um, strong majorities or even super majorities for, con for constitutionally stretching or uh, or big programs, right? Um, you know, I look at Obamacare. Just think about all of the Sturm und Drang around Obamacare. And part of that is because there was, you know, they tried to use the slimmest margin to pass that as opposed to trying to find a way that had some, you know, Republican support. Um, and that created problems, right? Um, if you think about, um, you know, um, imagine if you had a war that was passed largely on party lines and, there was a, and we had polarization like we do in the country now. And can you imagine if Congress passed a declaration of war that was party line right now, how unpopular that war would be? Because right from the get-go, you'd have, in, in this case, Republicans are against it. Now, it's not likely because actually, I think, you're, I think that the premise of your question is not true right now. 
a lot of people in Congress actually like war. Okay? Um, they love to spend money on the Defense Department. Even when President Biden asked for less, they still gave them more. Okay? Um, it's also the case that there's been a lot of sentiment on Capitol Hill when President Trump wanted to get out of Syria and, and, to, uh, and Afghanistan, that Congress should try to rein, in his, rein him in on this, right? Like, they wanted to make it harder to get, for presidents to get out of wars than it is to get into them according to the de facto system we have now. So I think they've got it bass backwards, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm forgetting the, the name of the bill that, that was uh, on this. Um, I, I can't remember it. But uh, as far as my experience in Afghanistan, I mean, um, uh, I guess one thing I would say about it is that even I was surprised at the extent of the massive amount of logistical capability that the United States has and the footprint we have around the world. And again, I'm, I'm fairly worldly. I travel a lot. And I, you know, I've spent a lot of time on military bases because I'm still in the Navy. I've been in the Navy for 16 years now. And I've worked with special operations. And I've worked with uh, CENTCOM and places like that. So I've done a lot of stuff that's purple. Right? That's, in fact, when I was in Afghanistan, I wore an Army uniform. So my pictures look weird. Like, Dad, are you some kind of stolen honor thing? Are you like play acting? You didn't even get the uniform right. Um, but I wore an Army uniform. I reported to an Army colonel. Um, but it was amazing. Like when, you went, when we went to Kuwait on the way to Afghanistan, just massive, sprawling bases. Not one, but many. You know, uh, gyms, you know, uh, air conditioning in the, in the desert, you know, just massive footprints. It, I, I went on Liberty. Um, so I got a pass to, to kind of leave Afghanistan for a few days. And so I went to Qatar. I'm like, hey, I want to get the hell out of here. So I went to Qatar. And you know, there was a Chili's in the desert with a pool. You could have two beers a day. Uh, you slept in these, like, these huge shipping containers that were in an even bigger uh, you know, kind of a corrugated steel building that was all air conditioned and super dark, like best sleep of my life. Um, it's just super weird and surreal. Um, you know, I had one experience that was really bizarre. It, it wasn't as cool as like Apocalypse Now when the, the, remember in the director's cut when they go to that French colonial's house for dinner in the middle of the war? But uh, one time, I, there was one of my fellow sailors that was, was leaving the country. He was going home, his tour was up, and we wanted to take him out in town. And, uh, uh, and so, Long story short, I won't get into the details, but we ended up going to another base that was, uh, had a lot of French people there. And they had a better chow hall, a restaurant even. So we're like, ah, we're going to go over there. And uh, so we're having this dinner at this like, massive, yet one of these other big bases in, in Kabul. Um, and it was just a big military footprint all over the place. And you know, it was, um, in one way, you're really impressed. Like, wow, our country is really good at stuff like this, right? Like getting lots of men and women all the way across the globe to project power. And we're really good when we get there to kill people. We are really good at it. And again, I'm not a pacifist. I'm a realist. And so I think some people need to be killed in warfare. It's the nature of international life. You know, States have to secure themselves in a dangerous anarchic world. There's no 911, yada, yada, yada. You've all probably read John Mearsheimer's Tragedy of Great Power Politics or Ken Waltz. Okay. Um, but we should not equate tactical success with strategic success. And repeatedly in our country's history, especially lately, we do that. We count bodies. We, we, um, we talk about um, uh, how you know, we're, we, we have this big footprint. We can you know, rain hellfires on people. We can use drones. We can do this. But how good are we at actually doing the things that these types of wars require, right? Building state capacity, um, trying to kind of change how the software in people's heads, um, understanding the sophisticated interactions in a culture, 
especially in a society riven with fractures like Afghanistan and with complicated things like, you know, you have, it's really poor, there's lots of ethnic groups and tribes. Uh, there's, a, there's the drug issue, which is a big one. There's religion, there's, um, you know, uh, the Pashtun Wali code and what that means, like all these cultural factors. You have corruption problems. Um, so like, it's an incredibly interesting country and incredibly frustrating. And I think that the best way to, to view what we needed to do in Afghanistan is to look at this, the New York Times published it, but it was, a, it was like almost like a whiteboard uh, and it showed all these different arrows going every which way, like we need to do this against that and this, and that, right? Um, and it just showed you that we had, we, there's no way in hell we could have done this. If that's what it was required, we were gonna have to do something that even we aren't capable of doing. You know, we're really good at doing Gulf War I, right? Uh, the Battle of 73 Easting, right? Kill Iraqi tanks, okay? Use our capabilities, our technology, our superior training, um, and on the flat, you know, on the flat deserts, uh, sands of Iraq, kill lots of enemy tanks, protect your own. Not so good at, at the intricacies of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. Um, I focused on Regional Command South, which is the, at that time, uh, before it got split in two, because it was even, you know, it was complicated, is uh, I looked at Kandahar, Helmand, uh, Daikundi, Nimruz, Aruzgan, and Zabul. Those are the six uh, provinces that I focused on. I worked at ISAF headquarters, um, but I did get to go out into the, into the south, which I um, was very glad I had that chance to. Um, it, it shed a lot of light, um, especially about this intense poverty of Afghanistan. And when I was there, Kabul wasn't what it is now even, because we've spent <laughs> lots of money there, and a lot of it's ended up in Kabul. Um, but you get outside and it, like, man, I was on this one uh, chopper ride and uh, I don't, you know, it, we were, you, it just, it looked like the fifth century. And not like, oh, West Virginia, that's like backwards, like that's not my view, but people say that. But no, I mean, this literally was like, uh, looked like it was from another time. Uh, maybe you saw a motorcycle, that was the like modernity showing up. Um, but, um, you know, just a lot of poverty. Other questions? Yes? Uh, I have two questions. So the first being, when we started talking about Afghanistan, you talked about when we went over there, the three goals we thought we should have, uh, decimating al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, punishing the Taliban government, and uh, capturing or killing bin Laden. And it took us 10 years to capture and kill bin Laden. And by that point, the other two goals had kind of been accomplished. Do you think we should have stayed in even though we hadn't got him at that point, or should we have transitioned out and used like over the horizon capabilities to find him uh, separate from Afghanistan? And then my second question was that when you talked about the book, The Afghan Papers, you talked about how flag officers didn't really know how to uh, build the Afghan government. So I was wondering uh, what your thoughts are on should they be the ones who are tasked with building an Afghan government when you know, their entire careers have been focused on how to tactically win a war and not uh, what to do afterwards. Yeah, I mean, the military is, a, is not the appropriate capability, but I don't think that the State Department or other parts of the U.S. government are going to be well suited to do that either. I mean, if we think government is good at producing, say, economic um, wealth or good at changing places, um, I mean, maybe some people in here think that we should do this, but, you know, maybe we should send them to places in the United States and do more. But I think that the Great Society proved, for example, like the War on Poverty, that we should be have some humility about the ability of government in a box, as Stan McCr General McChrystal talked about. Right? He was going to send government in a box to places like Helmand. And, um, you know, those types of plans don't usually work, right? There's a kind of, and what's interesting is General McChrystal wrote a really good book uh, called Team of Teams. Um, it's, a, it's actually a management book. And he uses insights from classical liberalism, like Hayek, about the importance of like, you know, pushing decisions down to people with the most knowledge, things like that. And yet he still thought about these top-down solutions in many ways, right? So it's kind of frustrating. Um, uh, what was the other part of your question? Sorry. 
say, uh, should we have stayed in Afghanistan? Oh, um, I don't, I mean, look, I'm sure that, that we were working hard to try to try to find and kill or capture bin Laden, so I don't know when we would have found him if we had changed courses. But I would have liked more focus on the explicitly CT mission instead of some of these broader things that we were trying to do. And, and maybe that would have yielded fruit earlier. I mean, there is talk, I, th I think it's in, now I can't remember which book it is, if it's in The Looming Tower, or if it's in the Bin Laden book by Stephen Cole. Um, but, but or it might have been actually in a book called on Operation Anaconda, actually. Um, but one of these books um, talks about how you know, there were real opportunities to get some of these high-level targets early in the war. Now, whether some of those forces were being deployed to Iraq or whether we just missed them, um, you know, so it's kind of a what if. I mean, the other what if that's really interesting is, I mean, I wouldn't even be here right now. My whole life would have been different. It's so weird. Uh, and all of our lives would probably be different. But there was a chance that the Afghan government was going to hand over bin Laden to the Saudis pre-9-11. Not even after 9-11, but before that. And they ended up not doing it. But you know, one good counterfactual is, if no bin Laden, then no 9-11? Or is there still something like that? Um, you know, who, who knows? What ifs? Um, I mean, I'm a political scientist, so I, I tend not to be, like, have a great man theory of history. Um, but the role of contingency is still one that we have to think about. Um, you know, I do think in the case of, of Afghanistan that Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden uh, were both important as figures in the decision to leave. I think Biden's decision was politically easier to make. Um, because he was kind of boxed in by Trump's deal and how public opinion had turned against the war and how the realism and restraint community really pushed on this issue. You know, whether it was the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft or Concerned Veterans for America, right? I mean, we spent millions of dollars uh, in the Stand Together community promoting um, the idea that we needed to end our endless wars and really tried to energize act activists through Concerned Veterans for America, which is a uh, 501c4 uh, uh, ad advocacy group. Um, so there was a lot of pressure on the Biden administration. And just that fraught issue is like Trump's withdrawal or Biden's war. So, so um, but I still will give him credit for, and for, for being courageous. Um, but I think Donald Trump was really important because it, like this, the, the, the um, Replacement level Republican president, right? If you're a baseball fan, hopefully the Red Sox are winning tonight. Um, but the replacement level Republican president was probably someone who never did the Doha agreement. So I do think President Trump was important uh, to that. And I think history, I don't know what history will say about Donald Trump. I won't even speculate on that. Um, but I hope that on at least the Afghanistan thing that, that he'll get some credit for ending this. Now, part of it is we, we'll see what happens, right? I mean, if Afghanistan is used as a stage of ground for an attack against the United States, it might not look so good. If that happens, I'm probably going to stop making <laughs> advocacy. Um, uh, no, but I have the confidence of my convictions. I, I think, I mean, again, we might not do the right things to still go after terrorist organizations with the intent and capability to hit us wherever they are. Um, but I think if we do that, then I don't think that we need to be there. And that's why I'm willing to get out and say that. Um, so I, I do think that it's, it's, it's ter it, there is a role for, for individuals, again, even though I tend to think structural factors, domestic politics, these things matter too. If you're taking IR, you know the levels of analysis debates. Um, I've, I think I've become, when it comes to positive IR, right? so um, explaining, describing, um, I'm less of a structural realist than I was when I was, when I was in grad school. Um, so I think of myself more as a normative realist. I think states ought to behave like realists say they should, even though they oftentimes don't. That's probably news to you, because I used to be a hardcore structuralist back in the days. Right? Yes? Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the future of the US relationship with Pakistan, uh, especially dealing with their relationship with the Taliban and Afghan in the past, um, and what that looks like, or what it should look like. Um, I'm not an expert on 
on Pakistan, I'll say that. Um, and Pakistan is extremely complicated because it's not just the challenges that you see in Afghanistan, like in the Fatah, Waziristan, uh, but then you have the whole India question, <laughs> China question, US relations. It's um, Pakistan is way more important than Afghanistan is to us. Um, you know, Pakistan's a nuclear country. Um, you know, India-Pakistan relations are always fraught and could lead to a nuclear strike, which I don't think anybody would like to see. But I think I'd go back to my kind of realism and restraint here, which is that, sorry, we did this in the podcast, so I'm going to do it again. So um, when we think about a country-specific question, we should never just think about that country. right? That's a kind of a, a conceit of area specialists. It, how we should think about a country has to be embedded within the framework of your grand st strategy. So you have to think about what are our ends. So for me, it's, it's protecting the territorial homeland of the United States and the citizens of the United States here at home. It's protecting the conditions of our economic prosperity. So that means like our ability to travel across the, the free seas, right, to keep strategic choke points open for our trade, things like that, keep people far from our shores. And it's protecting our liberal democracy here at home. You know, so, and you know, when other countries try to manipulate uh, our politics, you know, we should take that more seriously. Okay? Um, so those are our ends. And then you have to think about our geostrategic condition, right? So if this is like the Revolutionary War time, we're talking about the Constitution, right? Um, what was the biggest threat to our nascent, you know, independent country? that the British were going to beat us and we would be strangled in the crib. So what did we do? We said, man, things don't look very well. Like, we're not, they're, they're not going stellar. We won some battles which gave the French some confidence to be willing to make an alliance with us. So we made an alliance with the French, and that was so critical to the rest. We would not have won the independence. It would have been hard to imagine us winning the way we did if the French hadn't intervened because of the threats to us and because of our, the balance of power and whatnot. Um, but Today, if you look at our country, some of these geostrategic conditions are important. Is the balance of power, does that favor us, or is it a situation that's, that's fraught? It's, it's pretty favorable, right? There are no peer competitors in the world to the United States. China is a near peer competitor. It's a rising power. But Russia is, you know, they have the economy the size of what, like Spain or Italy? Okay? They spend about $65 billion a year on their military. And they have a big country to defend, right? It's a gazillion time zones. Um, we, you know, we spend upwards of 800 now, billion. Um, yeah, they have nuclear weapons. That's important. They have some power projection capability, and they're near abroad. But they're not a threat. Like, does anybody here think that another country is going to invade the United States? No. Like, you might be worried about a non-state actor doing something like 9-11. But there's, and, and one of the reasons for that is something really big happened in 1945. What happened? What was the big deal in 1945, aside from you know, VJ and VE Day? It was the start of the nuclear revolution, right? I mean, you could argue it, 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 it started earlier, right, when we started doing the Manhattan Project. But in terms of actually using a, a nuclear weapon as a war, as a weapon, nuclear power as a weapon of war, right, that changed the game in many ways. So imagine we have nuclear weapons in 1917. Do we have to worry as much about the threat of Germany, right, of the Kaiserreich? Probably not, right? Because um, any of those fears of the Germans invading Maine or something or, the, or helping Mexico invade, like as long as you have credibility, capability, and, and commitment, you can use nuclear weapons to deter attacks on your, on your homeland. And it's pretty robust, right? It's easy to make people believe you'll do it especially a country like ours. We did it twice. We killed hundreds of thousands of innocent Japanese people. You don't think we'd do it if someone invaded us? Okay. So um, that matters, the nuclear revolution. We have weak neighbors, and we have big moats between us and the rest of the world, big ones. And they had, like, I, 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 I don't like to take my advice on international politics from cab drivers in Cairo, so I'm not a big fan of Thomas Friedman. Um, you know, but he talks about the world being, you know, flatter and smaller and all this other stuff, right? It's like a pancake. Um, 
Yes, the world is smaller in some ways, but it's still really hard to project power across large bodies of water. And we're one of the only countries can do it. So you don't, I don't worry about like the million man swim by the Chinese. Okay. Um, so how do they get here? It's really hard to do amphibious operations. Look how hard D-Day was when we had an aircraft carrier called Britain right off the coast of France. Okay. So it's hard to do amphibious operations, particularly with a technologically sophisticated country like ours, that even if we were scared of using nuclear weapons in the middle of the Pacific when the Chinese armada came across, as soon as they got to the shores, we'd just, it'd be like a turkey shoot. Okay? You use anti-access area denial technologies, and it would, it would be rough on the Chinese. I mean, it's probably going to be rough on the Chinese if they try to attack Taiwan for that reason. Amphibious operations are hard. And if you're a Marine, God bless you, but don't do it. Right? Read the history of amphibious operations. Okay? It's not pretty, particularly for Marines. Um, I mean, they're incredibly brave. Like, D, you look at D-Day or, or um, uh, Inchon, right? These are amazing, you know, stories of great bravery. And, and especially Inchon was a remarkable um, operational strategy, right? But it's hard. Um, and then you add to that that we have the world's strongest Navy, world's strongest Air Force, uh, the Navy has an Air Force. The Marines have an Air Force. Um, we have a strong army, a standing army, a really big one. I don't know what the founders would think about that. Um, so we have a lot of power. And there's no way that the Eurasian balance of power, which has traditionally been a concern for realists and for geostrategists, right? the worry always, like in the past, was if one country dominates from France to Japan, UK to Japan, that they can harness those two industrial important population centers, harness that together, and then pinch the new world. Either through invasion, it's like 1812 over again, or you know, in some other way where we're just kind of squeezed. We don't have to worry about that, right? Our European allies are stronger than their adversaries. Like Germany, France, and the other EU countries could easily deter conventionally the Russians. Uh, France also has nuclear weapons, so how are the Russians going to get past, you know, uh, Alsace-Lorraine? I mean, it's going to be bye-bye Moscow, right? I think the French would do it. If you read about the Battle of Algiers, they, they are not uh, shy. Um, so, um, and then in, 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 in East Asia, yeah, there's a worry about China. Could China dominate that area? I think that that's a worry. But again, we've always been worried about Eurasia falling under the sway of any single power, not a particular zone. Okay? I mean, one of the reasons why Kissinger was so good with the Sino-Soviet split is because we were worried that if the Soviets could take Western Europe and then they had this alliance with China, that they could dominate Eurasia as a kind of cons a, a communist axis, right? But the Chinese and the Russians are natural enemies in many ways. We should be trying to get out of the way of some of that natural enmity. We should stimulate balancing by those two countries. So this whole long wind-up to your answer is to say, um, we don't have to worry about Pakistan as much as most people think, probably, because it's more of a worry for India and Afghanistan and China and other countries there. It doesn't mean we should ignore it. There are obviously ways that we should engage with them diplomatically, with trade. Um, and you do have to worry about the issue of terrorism, so you'd want to be able to cooperate with Pakistan, intelligence sharing, things like that. So we should try to improve our relations with Pakistan for that reason. Because again, the only strategic concern we have in that part of the world is terrorist organizations with the intent and capability to hit us. Yes? If that realism, realist view of the pullout outweighs maybe a realist support of, of that pullout. Um, and you know, the, the credibility on the world stage, accountability, lives lost and resources uh, taken into account. So credibility has been brought up a lot. Um, and there's a good scholarly liter literature on this. Daryl Press at Dartmouth has written a book on, on uh, credibility that's, I think, worth looking at. There are others. But what I would say is that. Um, we spend 20 years, trillions of dollars, thousands of American lives in a strategic backwater like Afghanistan trying really hard 
to, to win that war. And we're going to say that we left after 20 years and now we're less credible? I mean, if you're willing to spend all this resources on a backwater, then wouldn't we spend a lot more? At least wouldn't our adversaries worry that we would spend a lot more on something that mattered? So I don't think it hurts your credibility. Um, the other thing is, like, credibility doesn't travel easily, right? Like, if I said to you, um, Uh, you went on to my, uh, to my second home and, and stole my mailbox, okay? Uh, and I let you do it. Would you believe that if you came to my primary home and came into my house and tried to attack my family, that I wouldn't have a credible threat that you would consider? Right? States view your credibility based on your interest in the thing. And Different things in the world we have a different level of interest in. They matter more or less. So you could argue, even with our current Primacist Grand Strategy, that the UK and Germany matter a lot more to us than Yemen or Iraq or Afghanistan. And therefore, the Russians aren't going to say, wow, they spent 20 years, trillions of dollars, thousands of American lives in Afghanistan, but they left and it was messy. So I'm not going to believe them that they have the capability to defend Germany on the northern plains. I just don't, I don't buy that. Because again, I think that states calculate th their interests pretty carefully because they have to. Particularly states that are, aren't uh, superpowers like us. Because the consequence to a non-superpower is much worse than it is. Like, Iraq is a bad war, it killed a lot of people, not good for the United States. It created all kinds of domestic politics problems because it gave cynicism to the American public. It increased polarization. Like, you could count a lot of things that Iraq was a mess for. But there's, as Adam Smith said, there's a lot of ruin in a nation, and a particularly a great power. We can sustain those kind of losses. Now, you don't want to do it over and over and over again. But think about Vietnam. We lost in Vietnam. We left. It looked humiliating. But in a mere decade, it was morning in America, and then 15 years later, we won the Cold War. So again, I, I, I think we should be careful about thinking that, you know, especially because I don't trust the people saying that, to be honest. I mean, look who's saying this, right? It's people that have been committed to America's forward presence and these wars. Of course they would use, I mean, that's why they said that the withdrawal was precipitous and hasty, because they never, they thought any withdrawal was precipitous and hasty. Right, General Petraeus talked about how we had to do this for generations. Yes, up, up in the back. Uh, you, sir. Just a curiosity there, hopefully piggybacking on the last comment. I think you made a credible case for why uh, the removal of troops and the end of operations could have been done 10 years ago, or could have at least been considered 10 years ago. But do we have any relatively recent models of where we've assessed the end game, realized we've achieved our goals, and actually succeeded in an orderly fashion of removing our presence and leaving? I mean, does anybody have a memory of mm -hmm. where we found it? Um, well, there is old cut and run Ronnie, right? So, uh, and I joke that because people don't say that. Why? Because a lot of people love Ronald Reagan, particularly conservatives. But remember, Ronald Reagan had over 200 Marines killed in the conflict in Lebanon, and he withdrew hastily and precipitously, right? And we left, even with that, that horrible cost to those Marines in the barracks. Do you guys remember this? Maybe not, but there was a, uh, there was a, a terrorist attack or a, it's not, I shouldn't say terrorist attacks, bad political science, right? Because they were attacking American forces. It's not terrorism by definition. Um, but there was an attack on, on uh, American troops there that killed, what, 238, I think, something like that. So that was an example where we did get out and just decided to cut our losses. And, and again, uh, I don't think that pleased some people, uh, particularly people who wanted us to be involved in the Middle East more intensely. But he, I think that was a success. But I think Americans have a hard time leaving conflicts. I think most states do. I mean, wars drag on long past their exp expiration date historically. I mean, look how long the history, the, the Peloponnesian War lasted, right? Uh, you had guys like Alcibiades making trouble. 
Um, you know, and I, 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 I don't, I wish I weren't, I wasn't right about some of this stuff. Like, uh, I mean, Andrew was, we've known each other for a long time. Remember I was always talking about the quarries of Syracusa and I was comparing that to Iraq like a crazy man, okay? If you've read the history of Peloponnesian War, one of the things that ends up happening is that the Athenians puffed up with hubris and, and uh, you know, led by this uh, demagogue, they end up, uh, you know, going to Syracuse. Like, talk about, um, you know, uh, fighting on the periphery and, and not uh, paying attention as much to the core. So they end up fighting in Syracuse, they get their butts kicked, and a whole bunch of them are then put into this quarry and they're dying of thirst, and Thucydides has this very robust tale of all this death and, uh, in there. And uh, you know, it just at that time reminded me, and, and a friend of mine uh, did a whole conference on, uh, uh, on Thucydides in which we, we kind of it culminated with the, the quarry scene. Um, you know, so states have a hard time doing that.